Okay. Hi. Um, just over a year ago, my family and I moved house. We moved from Brighton to a small village in the South Downs National Park. And we absolutely love it where we are, and this is the view from our garden. And we're so fortunate, it opens out onto the fields. There's a little stream at the end. It's perfect for walking and hiking, and uh, we even ate some of our own veg this year. So where we live is beautiful, um, but it feels like a very kind of polite kind of nature. You know, it's, it's sculpted by rules and regulations. Sometimes feel like it's pretending to be nature or something. It is nature, of course, and that everything is, but it's definitely not the wild. And yet 45 minutes away is an estate called Nep. So it, was, uh, it dates back to the 12th century and until quite recently was a struggling farm until the owners, tired of losing money, decided that they'd try something radically different. So they started a project where they'd hand over the keys to nature itself, really. So they'd try their best to sit on their hands and see what happened. They'd interfere as little as possible. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but doing nothing isn't the most celebrated approach to modern life. <laughs> and yet, as they did just that, they started to see some pretty stunning things happen. So in one instance, they left an old dying oak tree to rot. Some, some ramblers uh, felt the land was being neglected, so they felt angry. But it turns out the oak tree is a team player. It was providing nutrients for the soil. And those nutrients were a beautiful gift for the insects. Unfortunately for them, the insects were a great gift for the birds. And the birds brought gifts of their own, seeds. So the cascade of like, natural changes had kind of started. Uh, in another instance, they left thorns and thistles to totally overgrow, um, which you might think is an eyesore until you realize that the thorns were protecting acorns, and the acorns have since become trees. So this project's been hugely successful. They've seen the soil regenerate. Um, they've rediscovered species of birds and butterflies that had been lost around here for a long time. But I think most importantly, they've taught us a very humbling lesson, that when we get out the way, nature does great things. So this approach to regeneration is sometimes known as wilding or rewilding. It's gaining traction around the world. It's thought it could prevent 70% of predicted species extinction. And yet only 1% of the money that goes to tackling the climate crisis goes to this. And that's a particular shame because it's a very cheap way of absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. But to be honest with you, my interest in nature is pretty specific to one species, and that's us. So my job is to help organizations to be less hierarchical and more human. And so as I looked at this approach, I asked myself, if we can rewild nature, could we perhaps rewild human nature too, particularly at work? Now, talking about human nature is tricky uh, because us adults are kind of stained by the modern world with products of industrialization. So I think it makes sense to first look at children, particularly through an evolutionary lens. So if you look at how we adapt, evolution has an absolute treat of an adaptive strategy for us. It's called play. So when I say play, I mean play without the interference of adults, particularly. So all mammals play, and we play particularly at the things that we need in order to survive. So think of puppies, they play fight. And there's research by anthropologists into hunter-gatherer tribes, and they find that children in these tribes play a lot, and they play particularly at two things, hunting and gathering. <laughs> so you might be thinking, OK, but these children are in tribes. Well, the closest thing we have to a wild child in today's society are children who follow a stunning pedagogical model known as self-directed learning or child-led education. So in this model, children lead the way and adults play the role of guides or gardeners, if you will. With little to no formal schooling, their job is to kind of foster an environment where 
a child's natural curriculum can take over, right? So the idea is to use life itself as the tool by which a child can negotiate, uh, can come up against boundaries, can grow in autonomy. And there's limited research on it, but it's found to have cognitive advantages, so particularly relating to creativity and curiosity, and socio-emotional advantages, particularly relating to confidence and cooperation. And I feel absolutely blessed because I've got to see our little boy and his friends grow up like this. And it gives to me an absolute like, eye-opening insight into the not only the importance, but the necessity of autonomy in us evolving as people, but maybe more importantly, the opportunity cost we're paying by having so many bureaucratic systems stopping us from growing up fundamentally. Now you might be thinking, okay, but these are children. Well, adult organizations are pretty much the same as schools, it turns out. So teachers become managers and grades become pay grades timetables become meeting schedules. Sometimes the uniforms are roughly the same. <laughs> and yet organizations are supposed to be for grown-ups. So I argue, first of all, I don't think all organizations treat all people like grown-ups. But actually, psychologically speaking, I think they stop us from growing up. Um, and that's because of the amount of autonomy stifled means that we are often not growing up developmentally speaking. So I ask myself, well, if rewilding can help nature and it can help children, what's stopping us from rewilding organizations? So I think one answer to that is about the mental models that we use. So we know that humans have become measurably more intelligent over time. But that's relating to abstract measures of intelligence. I'm not always so sure where it comes to practical intelligence or wisdom necessarily. But we have been getting more intelligent uh, in, in the abstract sense of the term. And that's because as the world's become more complex, we've had to increasingly rely on mental shortcuts, concepts, maps to navigate change. But as the saying goes, the map is not the terrain. And yet we confuse the maps we use for reality itself. One example of this is organizational charts. We often think they're true, that they're the terrain, but they're not, they're maps. So organizational structures have become, let's say, more sophisticated over time. But I argue that they all have one design flaw in common, and it's that they were designed by machine engineers. So you have uh, Taylorism and Fordism is where we got line managers from the factory lines. Uh, then you have Toyota where we got lean manufacturing. Uh, software engineering gives us agile and all sorts of others. All of these are increasingly uh, more sophisticated but they still make the error, the error of applying machine logic to humans. But humans aren't machines. We're animals, we're nature. And so I think what we need in order to rewild human nature in the workplace is to shift to a more complex metaphor. And I can think of nothing better than nature itself. So I wanted to give to you today a five metaphors that are examples I think might help you to rewild your organization or maybe even rewild yourself. So metaphor number one is observe and interact. This is a key principle in permaculture, which is a nature-led approach to regeneration. And I have a story of my own, actually. I was helping some friends on their farm, and uh, they asked me to plant lemongrass around the farm, so dotted around. So I came back to months later, and some of it had thrived, and some of it had struggled and hardly survived. So they asked me to move the struggling ones to the thriving ones. And so I came back months later again, and they were doing great. So I wonder what we could do in organizations. Perhaps we could give, be given more time to test and find out where we grow best. And then when we find out where we grow best, maybe we could water that area and put more energy there. A second metaphor is build green bridges. So if there's one problem I've heard in every organization I've worked in, it's we're stuck in silos. And I think this, this applies to any wicked problem. When we're stuck in silos, we struggle to collaborate. Um, if you look at an organizational chart, it's obvious because we're pigeonholed. And if you fly above the UK, it's the same. You look down and you see a mosaic of silos. So in Scandinavia, they've tried something called green bridges. So these are pathways that connect different habitats. They allow for cross-pollination, 
They allow species to go and find better equilibrium. And we know that the space between two habitats is unique because it benefits from the qualities of both. So it's kind of a super habitat in effect. So again, in organizations, if you think of habitats as teams or departments or areas, how can we build more bridges or how can we find the overlap that acts like a super habitat? Metaphor number three is use small and slow solutions. So the buzzword transformation is one that I hear a lot and it really bugs me because it, it, it assumes that transformation is very fast and sudden, very big in scale and that somehow all of the consequences and implications are positive. And yet we know that transformation has not been what our environment likes. And actually in organizations that go through transformation, we find that um, burnout is a massive problem. The other problem is that we actually don't know the second and third degree implications of transformation until it's far too late because it happened too fast and big. So I favor a way of changing things that is smaller and slower. It asks us to bring people on board because we know that systems tend to only accept their own solutions anyway. Um, it happens in a slow way so that it doesn't uh, kind of create unnecessary harm. And I've found as we do this, through lots of tiny experiments, compound effects actually lead to quite significant change, but without the upheaval and even heartache that can come with trying to change everything at once. Principle number four is value diversity. This metaphor I think is so important. I feel so grateful to be living in a society where increasingly there's conversation about diversity. I argue, however, that I think the level of conversation tends to be immature. We see diversity in, I think, quite superficial ways, tending to be about groups, whether it's race or gender. So when I talk about diversity here, I'm talking about diversity of opinions, of points of view, of perspectives. I'm talking about getting people who disagree with each other to learn to understand and listen to competing points of view. Otherwise, I think what we have is left-wing organizations become more and more left-wing and right-wing organizations become more and more right-wing, neither benefiting from the self-correcting qualities that the other might provide, neither coming towards union or equilibrium. And so the need for a diversity of ideas is, I think, incredibly important to be able to listen to each other. And I think that can give us more resilient organizations and societies but hopefully a far more tolerant one as well. And then principle number five relates, and it's uh, weeds are plants too. Um, you might have heard the expression that a weed is a flower in the wrong place. Um, in the UK, we have ragwort. It's a, it's a really detested weed. On the Isle of Man, though, it's called kushag. It's their national flower. <laughs> and so we're very quick to judge things and maybe people as weeds as well. This summer I met my nemesis, its name was bindweed, um, only to discover months later that it's a pioneer plant, so it prepares the soil. So I'm wondering how many people do I judge as weeds? And it's actually that I'm blind to the value that they're already bringing me. And I think that could be true in organizations and in most of our conversations as well. So I think we've built organizations in the image of machines, but we're humans, we're not machines. We're animals, we're nature. And if we're to rewild human nature, I think adopting nature as the metaphor makes sense because it's a very simple and tidy metaphor, but it's not simplistic. It understands complexity. It understands that chaos is sometimes very ugly and very messy, but incredibly intelligent at the same time. So if you're a leader, my suggestion to you is to stop helicopter parenting and become a gardener. Try and foster an environment where people's natural curriculums can take over. Um, try and foster autonomy. And this, I think, can help us all individually grow up. Um, and if we manage to do that, not only can we help our mental health improve, but we can reach our potential. And to me, reaching our potential means being able to contribute more to others. And who knows, maybe the planet as well. Thank you.